we know that in the industry the turnover rate is horrendous. Yeah. You know, you can have you can easily have a staff turnover rate of like 150 um, percent and be basically changing your workforce every nine months, give or take. Welcome to the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Ford, friends. I'm your host, Lee Safar. And this is sadly the last episode of this series. I know that I say that every time we get to the last episode of a series, but I really mean it every time. <laughs> like I, I wait for a week where I'm not like, oh, this is sadly, I'm not going to say that. But really, this has been a really fantastic conversation. Erin, thank you. This feels like these episodes have gone for five minutes and then we look at it and it's 20, 25 minutes later. So Big thank you for being here and having this conversation at such short notice. Um, We're talking about the big brands versus the independent cafes. And we've covered a whole bunch of subjects. And all of them are talking about how both of these models established themselves. And so we talked about their past and their present. Now we want to look to the future. So what does the future hold for these brands in your mind? Yeah, so ma- I mean, this is a massive topic, obviously. Yeah. Um, so we'll get a little, it, it, it's as good as synopsis as we can. I think um, just as an industry, there's going to be a massive drive for transparency across the industry. Um, there's been there's been a huge impact of the pandemic in terms of drink at home, and what drink at home has done is it's increased demand for retail, but it's also it's also increased the base point in terms of education for the average consumer because uh-huh. all of a sudden they're having to purchase and deliver coffee based drinks as to you know to as good a standard as they can mm-hmm. um to uh, and and they're having to do a lot of research into that and they're spending loads of time looking into it and uh you know there's a there's a guy i went to school with he's a pro rugby player and i uh-huh. noticed on his instagram he's like seeing latte art and stuff because he's got one <laughs> oh, really wow. into coffee and it, you know it's 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 stuff like that and yeah. and what what we really need to do is we need to make sure that as an industry we are we're giving customers that and we're we're moving mm. with them because the the brands that aren't doing that are gonna they're gonna fall away a little bit um they're gonna fall behind because consumers can't buy into it. it it also fits really nicely into the i suppose the economics pandemic that we're that we're within or on the right on the on the outskirts of because the perception is that if i'm making drinks at home i'm saving myself money um so there's also a shift to drink at home because of mm-hmm. because of that i said the perception because the reality of it is that actually if you're buying 250 gram bags of speciality coffee probably not cheaper like by the time you try and work out to dial in a grind and you've wasted three quid's worth of coffee um in in your grinder (laughs) it's it's probably not um so definitely transparency um i think we're also on the big brand side i think we're going to see um some more horizontal market integrations we spoke about that Mm -hmm. a little bit right at the beginning um we we mentioned that cafe being sixth or seventh largest coffee uh, brand globally, um, despite being primarily a food brand. And we all know about Nestle and the, the kind of acquisition of path they've been on uh, as well, um, and uh, buying into Nespresso, Nescafe, Nescafe Blue Bottle, um, and also the license for selling Starbucks products in retail, mm-hmm. um, and that, and that kind of also leads me nicely into. A massive growth area, which is going to be the um, uh, couple of drinks to go market, like the RTD section. Hands. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, ready to drink. Yeah, so that's going to be a big, big push. You're, you're even getting smaller brands producing those and getting them canned and bottled um, by uh, by bottlers, and that's really good because it helps people consume your brand, engage with your brand while they're not near your stores. So. Mm. Um, in a way for an independent that's even more valuable because they don't have the reach and they don't have the um store presence that someone like starbucks or someone like costa Dunkin' donuts do um but if you can get a deal with a a supermarket um and you can get your rtd product in there then all of a sudden you're kind of a big brand because you've Mm -hmm. got all of those dollars under your belt so that that really helps and i think that'll be a big push as well um and cold drinks, I think, 
and non coffee based cold drinks. We're, mm. we're we're talking about what is a coffee shop. We're talking about specialty coffee, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the reality of it is that a lot of the drinks offering or the, or the sales is is also non coffee based drinks. Um, so certainly, certainly, it's a non- huge one. Hot. Huge, yeah. So last year, um, the figures came out. Last last year, Starbucks um, sold seventy five percent of their drinks were not hot. Mm-hmm. Um, so between iced coffees and all the kind of non coffee based frappuccinos, it's a massive market. Things. It's huge, massive. And and yeah. the smart people are realizing that signature drinks are the way forward. It's not about juices. It's not about um, you know your lattes and your you know your drip coffee and whatnot. It's about people wanting a different experience other than coffee because people are becoming more health conscious. So they're looking to and and that's a trend that keeps evolving. So when you're serving like the kinds of drinks that have less sugar in them, there's a market for that where they're, you know, really healthy kind of mocktails. Uh, there's a, even if it's got a little bit of coffee in it, there's a market for that as well as I continue to be shocked by how many people want just straight up give me sugar, syrup, coffee, oh, yeah. chocolate, caramel, blah, 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 cream, sprinkle more shit on top of it and that's exactly what i want and then uh i suppose con- contrary to that as well i think there will be a there will be a big drive in terms of health mm-hmm. health uh conscious drinks mm-hmm. um and in the form of things like boosters um and we we see a lot of the key with with delivering those drinks to so if you can just add like a small add-on product that can add 30 40p to the cost to a drink, then that's really valuable for most mm-hmm. brands. Push that spend per head a little bit. If, I mean, we work with a, a substantial juice brand in in London, um, and if we look at Joan and Juice, for example, uh, that a lot of yep. the listeners will be familiar with. You know, you can go in there looking at a juice that's bought five quid or seven eight dollars, um, and before you know it, by the time you've chosen this out of the other, it's up to like twelve thirteen dollars oh, yeah. or something like that. You know, and beyond so it's really easily done and it's a great way of pushing spend per head but i think there will be we will see in the market a push for those kind of healthy add-ons like mm-hmm. uh, wheatgrass booster or whatever Rishi mushroom powder oh yeah yeah all, all of the that, adaptogenics the, yeah. all the adaptogens are the thing uh, you know, um, when we're looking at these two business models, the the big brands and the independent, what role do you think the future holds with regards to automation for both of them? Oh, it's interesting. Um, I, I've got I've got a kind of bit of a love hate with automation. Um, mm-hmm. I, I definitely it's definitely needed for consistency. Mm-hmm. Um, but coming back to one of those key points I've mentioned before about people going into coffee shops and into those environments because they want that social interaction. Um, Mm -hmm. I think as long as automation can be there, not at the expense of that social interaction, then it will have a good place in the market. And the danger for, the danger for brands like McCafe, for example, is that they're bringing all the touchscreen stuff, touchscreen ordering, which they've had quite some time with, Mm -hmm. with us, all the food product. Um, but they're also, uh, bought in contactless collection uh, during the pandemic. So you're ordering on a screen, your product's put on the table with like a ticket number, and you're almost there. There could almost be no one in the in the yeah. store. Oh, yeah. that's customer facing, um, and they guess that they're not reliant on that. But if you've got smaller brands who start to want to buy into automation because they can see the benefits of it with the big brands. I think they're going to be really suffering because they're going to be losing those key points of difference that they've got with big brands. Um, automation is amazing for um, the staff turnover rate. And Friends, World of Coffee Dubai is back in 2024 and I am proud to announce that the Daily Coffee Pro by Mapper Forward will be the official 
official podcast partner for World of Coffee Dubai for the second year in a row. The Roasters Village will be a one of a kind destination for all things coffee. As an exhibitor, introduce your artisanal roasts to an international audience and gain valuable insights from their perspective. Visitors, immerse yourself in the celebratory coffee culture experience by sampling exclusive cups poured with passion from cafes worldwide and absorb insights that will elevate your own appreciation of all things coffee. Whether you brew coffee or just love savoring a fine cup, this event gathers the global coffee community under one roof in an amazing city. Join us at World of Coffee Dubai in 2024 at Dubai World Trade Center from the 21st until the 23rd of January. Tickets are available at Dubai worldofcoffee.org or you can contact us on social media for any questions that you might have at mapforward.coffee. Get your tickets now folks, come see the podcast being recorded live and we hope to see you in January in Dubai for World of Coffee. We know that in the industry the turnover rate is horrendous. Yes. You know, you can have you can easily have a staff turnover rate of like 150% um, and be basically changing your workforce every nine months, give or take. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've got companies like uh, like Chimberly, for example, they've uh, got a coffee machine which communicates with the grinder mm-hmm. and it monitors the extraction time and it automatically adjusts the grinder um, to, to compensate. So to an extent, you really don't need that level of expertise front end that you had to. So if it's me making coffee or if it's you making coffee as a Rockstar Brister from Australia, um, <laughs> then uh, in theory, the marginal difference will be irrelevant. A lot small. Yeah. 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 Much smaller. For folks who are listening to this, I am going to do a shameless plug here because I think what is going to determine the difference between amongst the independent cafes next year is those who are prepared. I think that. Next year is going to be an incredibly challenging year for our industry. And that is because of from an economic perspective. I would encourage you to find a consultant to help you plan your next 12 months across 2024. And the shameless plug isn't that I'm the consultant you should hire. You should hire Aaron. You should hire me. You should hire any consultant that you have confidence in. We are running in Dubai. Uh, workshops, live full day workshops in December and January of how to plan your business for 2024. So if you're listening to this and you're interested and you feel like taking a trip to Dubai, there's only 10 people in the class, uh, get in contact with us. But um, Erin, I'd love to wrap up this series by asking you about planning when it comes to independent coffee shops. And the reason I say this is because pretty much every customer you talk to as a consultant, they tell you, I want to be the next Starbucks, right? They want to be one of these big brands. That's their aspiration. What's the extraordinary amount of planning that goes into a cafe, even just to become a good independent, let alone become a Starbucks? Yeah. I mean, um, well, most, most, coffee shops or independents will go on a journey that will last anything between a year plus in terms of planning for mm. opening and if you're not doing that you're probably about to bin quite a lot of money yeah. and so we're talking about the coffee shops that you find in your like, like suburban areas that maybe you'd walk into as a customer and think well oh, it's a little bit rough around the edges there's been a heck of a lot of planning that's gone into that and yeah. um to to actually get all the processes in place to get all of the environmental health stuff and um, even just understanding all the kit and training staff and putting menus together, uh, even choosing what coffee you're going to be mm-hmm. buying and and, and, and and selling, what drinks you're going to be doing, what price point they're going to be. It's absolutely colossal. It, there's so much uh, planning and, and work that goes into it. And in, in terms of picking up from your point of, preparing for the next year we we find like our company has been through many recessions and we've always found that the, the companies that have got the most data and the most uh in-depth analysis of what they're doing are the ones that 
still do really well. Like mm. they still make money. They still do really well. And they, they still are successful businesses. The ones that go out of business are the ones that kind of could open and just be busy because there's enough demand. They're, they're probably not fulfilling a gap in the market and they're probably not doing things particularly well. But there's so many customers for copy that you kind of can just open the doors and, and have people walk in uh, when it's not a recession. And then when, when the market tightens up and there's fewer customers available, all of a sudden that's not, that's not good enough. And they start to, to drop off. Mm. Um, so it, if, if you can make sure that you're secure in your, in knowing who your customer is, uh, and knowing what your target is, then that will pay dividends. And one of the first questions I ask, I, I chuckle when you said it, people listening who are going to want to be the next star, like this, et cetera, because. I could probably count on one hand the number of clients that I've had who have not said that to me when they've sat down at the table. Like it's, we no want to one, be the next no one goes, Yeah, no one, no one goes into business because I want to open just one and I yeah. want to work in it for the rest of my life. It just doesn't happen. But the first thing I always say to them is, great, so what's your USP? Like, why am I coming to you rather than Starbucks? And, and then like, they go, US uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so we we make sure we establish that yeah. right from the get go because it's just so key. Unique selling proposition for anyone that's listening that doesn't Sorry. know that's okay <laughs> because the the thing is that people we would you know we talked about barrier to entry the low barrier to entry in a previous episode, and it's not people's fault that they don't understand these terms. It's it's a it's a consequence of having such a low barrier to entry that allows you to just kind of fail up in this industry. Whether you're in a part of the professional workforce or you're a business owner, I far too many people get to the point where they're opening their first cafe and they think that they're an expert at opening cafes, so they already go looking for opening their second cafe. How many times do you see that yeah. happen, right? Yeah. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You need to spend the next three years minimum learning how to get customers through the door. Well, aren't they just going to come, Lee? No, 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 no. We're going to start working on customer acquisition planning. Yeah, customer acquisition and also customer retention. hundred uh, percent. Like so many people, they they want to increase turnover and they, they're they looking outward first and they're not thinking about how can I leverage the customers that I already have, the customers yep. who are already loyal to me, how can I either increase their spend per head or how can I make sure that they come back so that yeah. I don't need to try and, I mean, customer acquisition is a much harder thing to do, right? Totally. Um, and it's all your focus and, in the beginning. Like you open a new cafe, your job for the first six months is customer acquisition planning, the like customer acquisition execution. The planning for that needs to happen when you're fitting out your cafe. So you opening your doors and saying, okay, now I need to figure out how to get customers. That's, I would argue, a little too late. Because most yeah. people are spending 100% of their budget and they open their cafe with $0 in the bank. They spend the whole budget on creating the cafe. Folks, I would hope that you would also budget into your budget 12 months worth of operating expenses to have in the bank the day that you open. That gives you a really wonderful runway, runway so that if something like a pandemic does happen or if you do the toilet breaks or whatever it is that's going on, you're not operating month to month to month to month to month because that's a scary way to run a business. You've got no room when that happens for anything to go wrong. So, Erin, if people want to get in contact with you guys and think about hiring you, how do they do that? Um, so I'm sure Lee will link my LinkedIn on there. 100%. Just uh, feel, feel free to drop me a message. Um, we, I, I really just, uh, as we said on the best episode, I like connecting with people and just um, jumping on a call. And sometimes it's a half hour chance. Sometimes it's two and a half hours as a night pack. <laughs> and um, it's a delightful but, two and a half hours, yeah. I must say, sir. <laughs> yeah. So, so don't please don't feel uh, feel worried about contacting me. Just drop me a message and uh, and and reach out. It's fine. And where are you based? Uh, so we're based in London, um, and Perfect. we service uh, the UK, but. In terms of consultancy and design, we service much broader fields. So okay, do get perfect. in touch. 
We will make sure that we've got links to everything in the show notes. Make sure that you do reach out if you're interested, folks. Erin, thank you for a, a bloody fantastic conversation. I really appreciate your time and your knowledge. And it's really wonderful having a conversation with someone who really does know their shit. Like all the guests, uh, we've been super blessed these last couple of years. Our guests have been awesome. Um, and you're just another one that we're adding to to that awesome list. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I think uh, I'm hijacking your job now. So <laughs> peace, love, and peanut butter. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Have an amazing rest of your day. <laughs> Thanks friends. If you enjoyed this video, here's what you should check out next. Consider supporting Mapper Forward on Patreon and be sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell before you leave.